Stolen Prayer from Alice Cooper's 1994 Last Temptation album. Absolutely phenomenal song. That entire album rocked. Uh, today we have Pastor Paul Honored from Metal Mission of Knoxville with us. This is going to be a great show. There's so much to talk about. Buckle up. Stay tuned. We're ready to rock. Welcome to the Song and Verse Podcast, a discovery of God's Word, one song and a few verses at a time. Here's your host, Rockin' Odd Todd. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Song and Verse Podcast. I am your host, Rockin' Odd Todd, and man, what a great show we have for you today. Alice Cooper's Last Temptation album shocked the music world. What's interesting about this album is it ended up on a bunch of Christian bookstore shelves. And so it, there was undeniable what was going on with not only the heart of Alice, but with the music as well. There was this underlying message of virtue and truth, and it was done with such a, a gritty, hard rock fashion that it was tough for a teen to not walk away asking questions and wanting to know more about what faith is and who Christ was. So it was a great album. So there were two songs on this record that Chris Cornell was a huge part of. Stolen Prayer, he and Cooper wrote together. Uh, and then Unholy War was actually a Chris Cornell song. I believe it may have even been a Soundgarden demo at one point. Chris Cornell was a huge part of this, and you can hear his vocals in two of those tracks clearly. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that today with Pastor Paul Honert from the Metal Mission of Knoxville. And this this episode was so much fun to record, and it was great to catch up with Pastor Paul. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. And with that, we welcome Pastor Paul Honored today from the Metal Mission of Knoxville. How's it going, Pastor Paul? Going great. I'm glad to be here tonight. Awesome. Awesome. So, so tell us a little bit about what goes on with Metal Mission of Knoxville. Well, we're a, basically an outreach ministry, and it kind of had its origins in a, um, a punk rock flea market. Um, hmm. my wife and I had gone to, and we, and we started kind of just looking around and, and thinking who's ministering to these folks. And I, and, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the band Place of Skulls, but the uh, lead singer and, and songwriter for that, Victor Griffin, him and I had been doing Bible study together for a little bit. And we kind of were kicking around some ideas and, um, we just decided, Hey, we just need to step out and do something. Mm -hmm. And he had contacts with some local clubs and we were able to do some metal shows call them night in the word and uh, place of skulls would play and I'd get up and preach in these secular clubs. And it just kind of snowballed into a homeless outreach, which was pretty vibrant until COVID hit and kind of took that away from us right now. And to where we actually planted a church uh, here in, in Knoxville. And we still are, we're still live streaming our services. Uh, there's another pastor involved named Pastor Eric Warren of Rutledge, Tennessee, and him and I kind of co-pastored together. And we're tag teaming the, 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 the preaching I'm doing through, I'm teaching through John and he's teaching through the book of Genesis. So it's awesome. been a real, it's been a real amazing ride. I'll tell you. Awesome. Awesome. So, you know, um, you and I have kind of met a little bit through the Fridays with Alice type, type uh, you know, blog that we cover. And um, I think that's kind of how we cross paths. And you know right. what I, what I found interesting is, and you mentioned some secular clubs and stuff. I've always found that if I approach people with the love of Christ, I don't get much rejection. Exactly. Have you uh, noticed the same? Yeah, because I think they're expecting us to be judgmental. Right. And as, as believers, and when we're not, I, I think it takes them off guard a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our big outreaches is a tattoo convention every year. Mm -hmm. And so we set up our table, and there's no question of who we are, and we have metal Bibles out. And, and we'll go around to all the different vendors and all the different artists and we'll talk to them and engage them and offer them a free Bible. And, and there's nothing but love there. There's, there's, I've not yet in the years that we've been doing it, met any opposition. I've not met anybody that's been um, opposed, you know, harsh with us or anything, just nothing but love and acceptance. And Hey, this is really cool. What you guys are doing. It's not for me, but it's really cool. You know, kind of thing. Right. So it's, it's been really exciting. Well, and, and, and the same for me, you know, with, um, with 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 the ministry we've been doing and and what I feel like we've been really called to do when when Billy Graham died what was it a couple years ago 
Yeah. Um, I've really listened to a couple of his audio books when I was doing some, some work. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that really kind of hit home with me is he was like, look, you know, the Trinity's there for a reason. The father God is, is the judge, you know, so to speak. Uh, the son is, uh, the savior, you know, the love element of it. And then the Holy Spirit's really kind of more like a conscience, uh, you know, guidance, wisdom that you get after accepting the son. And he's like, you know, all throughout the Bible, we're called to be like Christ. And so we're called to love, you know, any of those other elements that you're trying to, to fit, you know, and pigeonhole yourself into, that's not what you're called to do. And yeah, I agree. That's a good point. That's oh man, it, 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 it totally rocked my world, you know, and um, I, I, I had always known a lot of Billy, you know, Billy Graham's message and whatnot, but I hadn't really listened to his words, so to speak. And yeah. uh, it was an eye-opening experience to read that book. So it was, it was pretty, pretty wild. So in this episode, we're, we're really kind of looking at Stolen Prayer from the Last Temptation album. Uh, I believe it was 1994. And, you know, other than the song Poison and Hey Stupid and, and you know, those two albums, this one leaped off the shelves at me, this Last Temptation album. Right. Um, you know, I was still in high school at the time, junior, senior, that, that area. And, man, it, it really rocked me because that was probably two or three years into the faith at that point. And to see Alice Cooper come out mm. and really, really just lay it out in an album, you know. Um, yeah. For me, Cleanse by Fire was the song that just – threw me over the top but then when I went back and looked at the rest of them the songs that is I was like man this is just laced with wisdom and truth and virtue yeah. and and so your take on stolen prayer you know I uh, I came across online and I was like man this guy's hitting that song to a T so I'd really like you to kind of go over some of that narrative that was awesome yeah, because when I first got that album, and like you said, it's just listenable. I listened to it over and over and over again, mm -hmm. every track. And but that song in particular, it just grabbed my attention, and and I could hear Chris Cornell's vocals in the background. I didn't realize it was Chris Cornell at first, and I just hear this awesome background vocal, and I'm like, man, that, who is that? Mm -hmm. So I did a little research, and then I read that it was Chris Cornell, and that he had actually written the song. And, you know, in light of what took place a couple of years ago when, when he took his own life, all of that just kind of like spoke to my heart so tremendously. And it was like, man, here he was so close, mm -hmm. so close to the truth. He was hanging out with Alice Cooper. And I knew what Alice Cooper had done, you know, with Dave Mustaine and such an impact he had on his life. Mm -hmm. I thought, man, if only, you know, what, 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 what could have been different if only he would have, uh, you know, maybe bought into the message better or, or listen better. And, and you know, so, you know, you always think about stuff like that, mm -hmm. but the song just, and the more I listened to it, the more it just spoke to my heart. And it was one of those songs that I'm in the car, I'm just hitting replay, replay over and over again. And, and it's just such a well-crafted song, but those lyrics had spoken to me very much. And I'm a bit of a blogger um, also. And so, I wanted to put it out on paper. I wanted to express it in some, and, and, and as I'm walking through this song, I'm thinking about how Satan just lies to us. Mm. And we hear that voice so clearly over the din when, and, and, and in God's voice is that still small whisper that we got to really train ourselves to hear. And if we're not in fellowship with God and we're not focusing on and paying attention to our relationship with him, his voice is drowned out, the Lord mm, is. Mm -hmm. And that voice of Satan is loud and clear. And I kind of related it a little bit to even Jesus's temptation in the garden where he's at his weakest point physically. Mm -hmm. He had nothing. He had no way of defeating the celestial being in the physical realm. But his only weapon was the word of God. Right. And that's the only weapon that was needed. And that's what we have. So, and you know, and, and the idea of the stolen prayer is like, even, and I think back to Romans 8, where it talks about if you don't even know what to pray, just groan and, and the Holy Spirit will take that and interpret it. So all of those things just kind of went into a ball and shook up together for me. And, and it's just it's still a very impactful song to me, even to this day. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And, and you know, what, what truth, you know, you, you're speaking there because, you know, <laughs> And, and, and when I was reading your post, I was like, you know, the fact that he spoke the word and, and I don't think, I, I think sometimes 
that gets overlooked that, you know, Jesus was using what was already attainable. And of course, you know, even as him coming down, being God in the flesh, he was teaching, you know, right. and trying to show others, you know, this is how it's to be done. And even when yeah. he, you know, prayed the Lord's prayer, he's like, look, it's not hard. Let's do it together. I'll show you, you know. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and, and I'm really kind of think a lot of Alice's music, even like, and I was kind of afraid at first to go back to some of that 70s, 80s stuff. And even back in those days, I really started kind of noticing that he knew that tug and that tug of war struggle between, you know, good and evil, um, you know, uh, Satan versus God, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, but he, it, it seems like it, it just didn't quite, the, the light hadn't, you know, flicked on the, quite the way that it should have in a way that, that he didn't, um, comprehend it or necessarily live it. I guess that's really what it, what I would say is the live part. And, you know, the two of them, he and his wife have become um, what they like to call missionaries of the arts. And you really work with a lot of teenagers out there in Phoenix, Arizona and stuff, and really work with those kids and say, look, just show up and we'll love on you. We'll, we'll teach you yeah. instruments and dance and expression and all that kind of thing but it's about showing up. And, and I think what he's really accomplished is his lifestyle, you know, and you talked about, you know, Dave Mustaine and some of those other um, members of, uh, you know, the rock world that have maybe gotten a chance to talk to him. I think even Marilyn Manson, he was able to hand a Bible to or something of that nature. And, and um, you know, who else, who else, gets a chance to talk to people like that and, and really, you know, cause Marilyn Mance is not going into any um, church and talking to a pastor or anything. Certainly so. not. <laughs> right. You know, so, so I, I know Alice is, is, you know, once or twice said that, Hey, I, I kind of got the picture that God placed me in the camp of the Philistines for a reason here, you know, sure. And, and to, to keep walking in that. Um, so in, in Knoxville, you know, you, you talked about having some, some, uh, some other other folks working there with you. What what do you see the vision, you know, going forward? We talked a little bit about this off camera. I really kind of see a revival coming and I hope, you know, I'm hoping for it soon. But <laughs> but um but are you what what are you feeling in Knoxville? What what what's going on up there? Is it all kind of shut down because of COVID or it's starting to open up again and people are starting to come out and do more things and some of the churches are meeting, but like the things that we would be involved in for outreach, we don't have access to right now. There's, there's no concerts going on. There's no real mm. events taking place. Um, the tattoo convention got shut down. And we can't gather more than, I think, 10 people, at the most 50. But we got to social distance them. And the homeless ministry, it's just, it, it can be chaotic mm. in a little bit. If you know, For me, it's cool because I'm, I'm all about chaos. It don't bother me. But like, People like my wife, who are very um, organized and very rule oriented, it drives her crazy because it's just it's just organized confusion. Mm -hmm. But they come out and they line up so nicely, and they await and they listen to the message very respectfully, and then they come through the line. But there's no way that we're going to be able to social distance them, and there's no way that we're going to be able to limit the number of people on that little empty lot that we meet on. So we're really limited on what we would normally do as a ministry and what, what mental mission was really designed to do. Yeah. So we've gone a lot to the online stuff and we are trying to make a more online presence. And, and, um, my co-pastor Eric and I were, you know, broadcasting our messages, but just really not sure. Uh, I kind of feel like we're at Mount Sinai right now, just getting the, the next plan. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's tough. I mean, you know, you're, you're talking about a lot of the people that you, you reach probably not having access to a computer. So, right. yeah. So, uh, man, so, so is there anything go going on as far as like taking care of the homeless? You know, I, I guess, I, you know, I still see some clusters down here in Brevard County. Um, and of course you can stop and give them a little bit of food or whatever, but I, I, what are they doing in, in Knoxville? I haven't even researched it here enough. I mean, is there anything for the homeless right now? Yeah, there's a, there's a, few good ministries here that are that are homeless shelters and and they have programs 
uh, uh, there's a place called the Knox Area Rescue Mission, mm-hmm. and they have thrift stores all over town, and they're and they do a great job of getting people off the street, and they provide I think 300 beds, and they provide meals throughout the day, every day, and and training and programs to get people off drugs and things like that. And then there's um, Salvation Army has a pretty strong presence here, and they have a housing uh, program. And then there's um, Lamb of God Ministries. There, so there's quite a few. Okay. Uh, Lost Sheep Ministries we have here. And then there's another th- group that helps people get housing. So there's plenty of, if you don't want to be homeless in Knoxville, you don't have to be homeless in Knoxville. Gotcha. But what gotcha. we're dealing with are, are people that just, they they just don't want to function in society mm-hmm. or there or there's addiction issues or they've been abused terribly or they've um or, or and the mental illness is a big deal yeah and we've even deal, dealt with a little bit of, of demon possession out there uh, mm. small level so every, everything you can imagine taking place oh yeah you know I, uh, especially in college I, I went on a number of mission trips um you know here in the states working with a lot of the homeless um LA, DC, and New York is where, where we all kind of went. And, and it was amazing to hear some of the stories, you know, of, of the, the people that are out on the streets and it's not what you would think. I mean, there were some college professors and, you know, some, some really well-educated people. It wasn't like, you know, what the narrative has sort of been painted to be, you know, there, these, these people have just had it rough and, you know, some of them didn't have the, the, the backing or the family support, friend support or wherever it was to help them with their illness, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, to flip gears just a little bit. So, so Metal Mission, I know you guys are very, very heavily, uh, you know, music oriented as far as right. heavy metal is concerned. Mm-hmm. How did that really, I, I know you talked about the punk bars, but, but how did it kind of spin over into a, a heavy metal presence? And how does that really, does, do you see that pulling people in? Oh, it does. Um, what, how it started was um, I, I picked up a CD of a band called Place of Skulls. And they, they, the lead singer for that, the founder of that band, he was the former guitar player for the band Pentagram. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that band. Mm-mm. But he was in Pentagram, and they were, they were traveling, doing the world thing, the world tours. And the Lord got him, and he got, became a believer, and he formed this band called Place of Skulls. Wow. So I went to a show, a local show, and I heard him, you know, I had gotten some CDs and I was a fan and I went to a show and then I heard him speak during the show and I connected kind of to what he was saying. And so I spent probably two months trying to find a contact for him. Mm. I finally got a, I found an email address that, that he would get, have access to. And we started getting together and hanging out maybe a couple months after that and doing a Bible study together. And we started a home church and we were kicking around this whole idea of what are we going to do for ministry? Cause it feels like we need to do more than just this. And so we, he told me about the first heavy metal church of Christ in, in um, Indiana. I think it's in. I think in I've Ohio. seen videos of that one too. Yeah. They're in Ohio. And oh, so okay, okay. We, we contacted the pastor, pastor Brian, great guy. And he, you know, he's like, well, I need to know about your doctrines. That's cool. Good. I'm glad you want to know about that before you sure. partner with me. Sure. So uh, we kind of told him what we wanted to do and he gave us some guidance and then we kicked around some names and we decided, Hey, metal mission of Knoxville, let's go with that. And then we started doing shows and we would invite other bands to come and play. And then um, we would do a secular club and then I'd get up and preach and People were really receptive to it. People were, it was dark. I couldn't see anybody, but I could hear the amens and the uh ahas and the preacher brothers. And and it was so cool because, because I had no clue. I had no Mm -hmm. clue what to expect. Sure. Getting up in a secular club and giving a message like that. So uh, we did like five of those. And then the club decided they weren't doing metal anymore. And they kind of gave us the door. So they, they stopped doing any metal shows at all there. So we haven't done a show in a while, and we were getting ready to do one at the church that we've been using for our Sunday morning services. Or Saturday, Actually, we're doing our services on Saturday mornings because that's when the church is available. Uh, we were getting ready to do a show there, and then, you know, the world shut down, and that was the end of that. So, you know. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting to me because so a lot of my friends that were metal back in the day, very intellectual, very smart, very um, uh, just bright individuals, but yet were typecasted for some reason as like evil and dark and all this other kind of stuff just because of the music that we like. And I mean, there's a lot of Christians that, you know, back in the day for me, it, it was broad. Um, White Cross, oh gosh, I'm trying to say, you, you, you put a lot of stuff up on Facebook showing what you're playing all the time, and I'm like, man, I associate with so many of those bands. Um, yeah, and on Twitter, I don't know if you're on Twitter or not, but I do a lot more on Twitter than I do on Facebook. Do you? Yeah. Uh, I'm so just sure. starting to get into the whole Twitter thing, and it, it's, yeah. it's a whole new world compared to <laughs> everything else. But, but long story short, it's like even those metal Christian bands – were kind of, you know, red flagged as like, I don't know if these guys are Christians or not. Tattoos, screaming, long hair, you know. And I even had a few people that would say the same things about like Petra and stuff. And it wow. was just kind of like, yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't quite understand why we can embrace a John the Baptist, you know, living in animal skins you know, and locusts and honey and all this stuff and see this dude is like a complete outcast when we're reading and some other, other players in the Bible as well. Yeah. But, but yet you can't see that this guy in metal plays that role, you know, or I don't know. I just, it, it kind of bothers me sometimes in my walk or, or just with, with other, other brothers and sisters of the faith to kind of see that they want to put God in this box and say, yeah, he can only move this way. And I'm like, well, that's just not at all what, you know, right. w what's happening here. So. Yeah. And that's a big part of our folk, our ministry focus is that there's a lot of people that have been hurt by churches. Mm -hmm. They didn't fit a mold. They didn't follow the rules. In fact, I, I did a message on a couple of weeks ago where, you know, I talked about that and I, and I brought up Marilyn Manson because he went to a Christian school yeah, and he was outcast and he was poorly treated. And I had a similar experience in, in a private Christian school in middle school mm -hmm. and it left a bad taste in my mouth and it caused some rebel. It didn't cause it. I chose it, but you know, it helped me rebel a little bit and go a, a wrong path. We have all these man-made rules and, and we have this business model of what church is supposed to look like now all of a sudden, and it doesn't fit for everybody. Right. And so if you don't fit that mold, you're not welcome. They're not going to tell you not to come, but they're not going to make you feel real welcome. So what we're trying to do is create an environment where you come as you are. Mm. You come as you are. Jesus loves you. He wants you to come as you are. He loves you too much to leave you that way. Right. But, you know, we teach holiness, uh, pursuit of holiness. We teach, you know, sanctification, all of that. But we're not going to go up to a guy that doesn't have the Lord and start pointing out his sins. Sure. Because that's his job. He's, he's earning his destination. Right. He's going to sin. Into, you know, uh, I'm very critical of other believers who um, hypocrisy. And I'll point that out if, if the Lord puts it on my heart or if I'm in a situation like that. But I'm not going to call out uh, unbeliever sins because that's not what we're called to do. We're called to lead them to Christ and let God fix them. Well, and, and, and I think it's really important, you know, and a lot of what this, what my ministry and, and everything, well, I should say God's ministry, not mine. Um, but what I feel like he's called me to bring up in this ministry is religion versus relationship. Yes. And, we, and when you have that relationship with your brother in Christ, you can bring those things to the, to the forefront. You know, exactly. you can talk about them. Um, and, and, and hopefully the same thing's going on where they can talk to you about yours as well. Right. Um, but you're absolutely correct. It's like, why are we so, why are we so hung up on pointing to the world and showing them where all their sins are when you haven't met them with the love of Christ first? Exactly. I mean, I, I just, it, it just baffles me because everywhere that I've really read in the word where Jesus is, is meeting with people, teaching people, healing people, He's always walked into that arena of love first. Right. And then pours out. And he's, he's building a relationship. Right. Exactly. You know, and I, 
even when I, because I'm teaching through the book of John on Saturdays, and when I got to the passage of Nicodemus, I thought, I'm preaching to Christians, so there's no reason that I'm going to preach a message about getting saved using this well-known, well-used passage for evangelism. So I looked at it and I said, you know what? Jesus is doing relational evangelism here. Mm -hmm. He took a phrase, you must be born again, and he used that specifically for Nicodemus because he knew that would resonate with Nicodemus and Nicodemus' worldview because Nicodemus is all about being a child of Abraham. Sure. I'm born into Abraham. I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're Israel. And Jesus's point was, well, you got to be born again. Well, how's that? How's that work? And he, then he explains it and it's relational and they're having a conversation. And then we learn later that Nicodemus buys in and he's a follower of Christ. Right. And, and you know, it, it, it's pretty wild to see how Jesus treats the disciples differently as well. It's, 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 it's like as if it's a conditional speak because you, you have enough relationship to know how to relate to this person versus others. So bringing up the Nicodemus, um, you know, uh, conversation, that's, that, I never really looked at it that way, and that's, that's completely right. It's like, you know, Nicodemus would get what he was saying, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, with Peter and, and using fishing and things of that nature, right. those, you know, to yeah. totally, totally. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I keep, I've, I've brought this up a couple of times, a few episodes back, and this just keeps resonating with me. We had a guest that talked about listening to music and how like, you know, he could take a specific album and just listen to it over and over again. And you know, he's, he's read the New Testament, you know, a dozen times or, or whatever, and he keeps getting asked the same question by people. Why do you keep reading it? Why, why didn't it soak in the first time? And, and that, that's his, his answer to him is, well, don't you listen to your favorite records, you know, over and over again and keep taking them in? And it's like, it's, it's totally, totally rings true. It's, it's an experience. You're, it, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes when, I go back and read it and I'm like, I did not even see that the first time around. Right. And yeah. And that's it, exactly what happens. Well, and it's, it's your relationship with God going on there too, because yeah. it's like, you weren't ready to see that yet. <laughs> right. And that's, that's yeah, I love because it's so, it's so shallow that a child can play in it and learn something, but it's so deep that a theologian can drown in it. Right. And oh, that's so beautiful. Many levels and layers to it. And it's just amazing to me. And, and I, and I love, Studying through, I love studying through the Old Testament as much as the New Testament, because you find the richness of the roots of our of our faith through all the things that God did through the Israelites. Yeah, and it's just you know there's always something like I I love reading through Leviticus. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely not into the law, and I'm not one of these guys that wants to tell people you got to live by the law, but I love reading the law because it shows me God's heart, and it shows me God's. This is. You know, we're called to love God. Well, what does it mean to love God? Well, we get a picture of that through the law. Yeah. And what did he set the law up for? He set it to protect us from self-destruction and yeah. hurting each other for the most part. It's, it's, it's the same guidelines we use to raise our children and, you know, set yeah. them up for, uh, you know, a healthy, uh, life sustaining, you know, way of living. Exactly. Um, and, um, you know, the other thing it, it really does is when you go back and read the law, you see how impossible it is for us to, to keep it yes. and, and how, how we needed an intervention and we needed yeah. the Savior. That's um, the other great part of it is it just shows you how much you need Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So I'd like to hear, so, you know, st st stolen prayer um, is really what we talked about quite a bit in this episode, but, but growing up, you know, what, what was... Was there one secular song or somewhere else in there that you really, really kind of heard something and, and you were like, man, that really makes me wonder more about faith and Christ and God or anything of that nature? When, when did you kind of come to Christ and was there a musical element at all with some of that as well? Well, music was the soundtrack of my rebellion, more, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in church for the most part until I was about, I got baptized when I was 15. And then from that point on our family stopped going to church and i just went you know totally the other direction sure and so you know i wanted to be a rock star so i figured well if i can't be a rock star i'll just live like one <laughs> and so i indulged in every possible manner that you could think of sure and, and went off to college and 
got in trouble, had to come home. And so it was all of this stuff happening. And, and, and in the meantime, I had grown up listening mostly to like country music as a kid. Okay. Grew up uh, that, so down t- Tennessee, Florida. where you've always been from? No, I'm from South Florida. Okay. Okay. And so there's this little town there called Davie outside of Fort Lauderdale. I know where Davie is. All right. There you go. So I grew up in Davie, Florida and, you know, boots and dip and all that. So mm-hmm. um, as I started driving my car, I realized that Motley Crue sounded a lot cooler coming out of my car. <laughs> Ellen Jennings. So <laughs> I kind of made a switch and it just kind of took me in a whole new direction because then I discovered all that decadence and, and wildlife. So um, the Lord took me through a journey because I knew better. And that was the mm-hmm. thing. I knew better for all this. And about the time that I was, I got married when I was 21, about two years in, a year and a half, two years in, I got to a level where my drinking was interfering with my marriage big time. And God was starting to speak to my heart. And at the same time, I was auditioning for some bands and trying to get into the music industry. And it was like, God just said, here's your choice. <laughs> you got to stop. And, and I prayed. I said, God, I don't even want to stop drinking. I, if you want me to stop, you got to quit me. And he did. I mean, it was gone. It was done. It was over. And wow. it was New Year's Day. Yeah. And I knew if I didn't, I wasn't going to be married much longer. So um, 30 years later, still together. Still love my wife very much. And um, then we started going to church. And, they, and we looked like we walked out of a Motley Crue video, me and my wife. And we show up at this church, and they're like, what do you like to do? We like kids. Well, we just happen to have an opening in the junior high youth ministry because they ran every other junior high youth teacher out. So yeah. we got thrown into that. My wife would be standing outside the door smoking a cigarette. Well, see you next week, kids. I mean, that's how raw we were. This is late, late 80, 80s, early 90s? Or? Early 90s. Yeah, early, early 90s. 90s. Yeah. yeah, we got married in 89. This is probably about 92. And God just starts really dealing with us and, and removing things from our lives. And this is when I started getting introduced to some Christian metal. And Bride, Kinetic Faith, was the first Christian yeah, album I ever got album. a hold of. And I was like, Wow, this is good stuff. Yeah. So um, I got I found Blood Good, and then I found you know White Cross and some other bands, and now I've got a great collection that God's allowed me to be able to build of good, wholesome, you know, uplifting music mm-hmm. with the same sound that I really, really like quite a bit. And it's been an opportunity for me to reach out to other people and to um, share music with them and say, hey, check this out. You might like this. And it's a good conversation thing. So it's been really a, a good thing. It's been a good journey. Um, God called me into ministry probably about 15, no, about 20 years ago. I got called into ministry. And uh, it's just been a wild ride. And, and then when we came here, and this whole metal mission in Knoxville thing has been like a phenomenon for us. And I, and I kind of relate it to I feel like God's driving the train, and we're tied to the front of it. And it's just going. Yeah. Wars are swinging open and things are happening. And every once in a while, I think I hear them laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. It, that totally relates more than. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, what's interesting is he knows our heart. Yeah. And I've noticed that when I take these little steps of faith, you know, I really start to see areas where I really, really enjoy things. He kind he opens that door and makes it yes. available. Yes, and and it's just so so amazing. And you know, I th- I think that's where that relationship word really comes into play because a lot of the stuff you can't explain to somebody just straight off the street. Right. Um, you know, you can show them love. You can give them food. You can give them clothing. You know, you can start the narrative, mm-hmm. and and really really hone in on that. But as far as really being able to share this kind of mindset and the transformation that takes place, that requires relationship to really be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of where, where I'm at, you know, in my walk and, and in my faith is, is really, it's just amazing. Like I said, he just kind of opens this door and next thing you know, there's a, a, a strong group of believers right there standing ready to walk it with you. Yes. And it makes it so much easier to step out in faith, knowing that you're, you know, backed and you have brothers and sisters willing to uh, stand in the word with you. I mean, right. 
yes. we weren't meant to do this alone. Um, no, I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that doesn't even, you know, that, that's not even the, the, the marriage element of it. It's just the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christianity. It's meant to be done together. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm trying to think what post it was that, that I talked about it recently, but, um, but there's, there, there's like sometimes this, I don't understand it. It's like this, this polarity shift in the body where, you know, one denomination or one group or somebody, you know, starts to act like they're a little bit better than the other part. And it's yeah. like, it's like the brain rebelling against the lungs or the heart rebelling right. against the kidney. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, without all of these pieces working together, doing what they've been called to do, this doesn't work. No, and, you're, yeah. I mean, it's not, you're saying things that I teach all the time. So it's like, mm -hmm. like we're on the same narrative, you and I, it's just so awesome. Yeah. No, it's when you look in First Corinthians and, and Paul says, "One of you says you're of Paulus, and the other one says you're of Peter." Stop that! Right, you got to be Christ. <laughs> right, right, Stop totally. Denominationalism, you know? yeah, yeah, and 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 it's you know, I I think we'll get there. I, I I think I see a lot of positive things happening. Um, and you know, believe it or not, you know, I, social media is one of these things that I just I can't stand most of the time. <laughs> but but he's called me to walk in it and yeah. and i think if you go in it prayed up and just just really wearing the armor of christ or you know armor of god i think you'll be fine but <laughs> you can get sucked in some pretty deep dark black holes yes. if you allow yourself to yeah i've and, been i've had to really train myself to ignore a lot of things because it's not worth, especially when believers argue with one another in public yeah. like that. About it's the like, stupidest doing? stuff, too. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you want to start a war? Post something about the tribulation. Oh, where I know. You think, where you think the tribulation falls. And you'll right. start a war. <laughs> right. Right. And, and you know, uh, well, that's, <laughs> there, there's all kinds of different holes we could go down there. Yeah. Um, but, no, I mean, this this has been great. It's been really good to, you know, really kind of sit and talk with, with, with another brother in the faith. That's really kind of hearing the same, the same thing. And, you know, more than anything, it's just one of those, I keep hearing when it comes to metal and heavy metal, hard rock, you know, those, those things that were associated with the devil and, yeah. and darkness. Yeah. I just keep hear God saying, those are my people. Those are my people. And Right. You know, I, I read what's his name's book, uh, Brian Head Welch's book. And, you know, of course, when he left Corn, you know, he really dealt with a lot of that, you know, the bandmates and the and and the the crowd and a certain amount of of you know what was going on there. And he was like, I feel like I left them. I feel like I, you know, accepted Christ and then went the complete other direction instead of sharing that. Right. And, sure. And you know, I, I may not, I may not agree with the way everybody does it, and and you know, and and I don't agree one way or the other with with that whole scenario. I think I trust a brother in the faith enough that if he's hearing from the Lord and he's put the right people in line with him to keep him accountable, mm -hmm. what does it matter? Wh right. Who am I to tell him what to do? Yeah, I mean, Blackie Lawless is another great example. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, I just listened to a podcast with him recently and he went into much greater detail than what I've gotten to hear before. And it was just so refreshing and so exciting. Oh man. I, yeah. When I read about him, you know, I was never a huge wasp fan. They were a little out of my, my wheelhouse. Um, it was kind of more Bon Jovi and the pop, pop glam rock before, okay. uh, you know, maybe a little anthrax and Metallica every now and then, but, um, but no, man, when I read his story and, and, you know, the, the one thing about him that was great is that, that song that's like F like an animal or whatever. Oh, the beast. Yeah. 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 And, and they were asking him like, uh, well, how can you have that narrative in your life and claim Christ? How can you play? How could you have played that song back in the day and claim that you're forgiven and you're loved and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, do I play that song anymore? Exactly. And they're like, they're like, no. 
And he's like, well, isn't that a testament of enough that I've been changed and I'm a new yeah. creation? And, Absolutely. and he's like, he's like, if that song had never been written, that song could never be played today. And the fact that it's never played now, it should be enough to you to show a change. And it was like, you know, he was just talking truth and like, you yes. know, just pouring it out. And, and I hear so many guys say, you know, our past is a defilement to God and this and that and everything else. And I'm like, if the apostle Paul's past, you know, led him to the narrative of the greatest missionary in the new Testament, and those things could be flipped on a dime and used for good. And they, they strengthen God's, you know, uh, narrative and that whole story. That's, that's amazing. That's miraculous is what that is. There's, you know, and then so. you look at first Corinthians and there's this list of things that Paul says, these group, this group of people are not going to be in heaven. And he names this whole list of, of egregious sins. But then he goes, and so were some of you also. Right. So he's acknowledging the past. He's acknowledging this is what God's delivered us from. And, right. you know, you know, when I was a kid growing up in, in church and um, we were, I was part of the, I was in a private school, Christian school. That was part of this fundy church. And they would bring these guys in. They would tell their testimonies. They'd spend 20 minutes talking about all this fun sin that they did. And then they'd be like, and then I got saved, and here I am today. And it would, make, it would sound like to me like, man, these guys had a really good time. They, had, they, they enjoyed themselves, <laughs> and now they're Christians. And so it glamorized the sin. Right. So like, you know, I have a past. I've done a lot of things I'm not proud of. But if I'm sharing my testimony, I'll say, yeah, I did some things. Or I might talk about a thing here or there. Right. I'm not going to glamorize that sin and make it sound attractive to somebody or make it sound, you know, or revel in it because it's, you know, it's part of my narrative. It's part of my testimony. But at the same time, we have to be careful with it that we don't make it sound like, you know, we don't glamorize it and we focus more on the change, you know, what God has done in us. Well, I think what's interesting is, and, and this is a narrative narrative that kind of comes up a lot is, you know, that cliche that we've got that, that void in our heart to fill. Right. And, and when, when you learn how to fill that correctly with God's word, you find so much more joy in him than you ever did in those things. But it's, it's another one of those relationship type things. It's not something you can just say and it happens, you know, right. it's somebody's got to earnestly search for that and find it on their own as well. And, and I think that's, that's just where a lot of this narrative is. It's like, you know, you, you can, you can stand on a corner and beat somebody to death and it's not going to go anywhere. But if you just continually stand with them in love, then, then hold on and and brace yourself for the change that, that will ultimately take place. um, If, and when that time is, is right, you know? So, yeah. And I'm, I'm really big on discipleship just for that reason. Mm-hmm. We walk with people and you share life with them and they get to see the good, the bad and the ugly in you and you get to see the good, the bad and the ugly in them, but you're sharing that together and you're guiding and you're directing and you're lovingly steering them towards the Lord through the whole process. Exactly. And, you know, instead of, you know, like you said, beating on people. I, I, I don't know. I remember a church we were visiting in Florida one time and a kid showed up at the youth group with a earring in his ear. And the pastor said, hey, next time you come, leave that earring at home. So the kid left the earring at home, but he left, kept it in his ear, you know, <laughs> never came back. Right. So, you know, it, it's like, what's the difference if that cat, kid has an earring in his ear? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, I mean, yeah. You know, so that's, we got to be so careful that we don't, you know, we don't build these parameters and, and make it difficult for people to find the Lord in. Well, and, and, and the crazy thing is the parameters are normally our parameters anyway. They're not even his. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know, we, every one of us have sin that we look at and say, absolutely no, definitely bad. But then when there's sins in our own lives that we're kind of, go, oh, that's not so bad. That's not such a bad sin. So, you know, we'll, we'll go overlook that one a little bit. And, that, and that's part of the sanctification process is, you know, getting rid of those quote unquote good sins too, you know, right. There are no bad sins. Well, and, and the, the way I used to kind of look at it, look at it is I had this sin box and like a particular sin. Ah, I'll keep that one there. I won't even think about that one. I'm going to work on everything else, but that one I just can't touch. And it's a, it's a dangerous mindset. It is. Um, 
but uh, you know, but you stick with it. You, you keep, you keep uh, building that relationship with him. And ultimately he's going to throw that box in your face. So. Deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, it may not be the way or, or the uh, um, probably in most cases, it's not the way you're going to want it to be dealt with, but it's going to be dealt with, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's better to just get it out there in the open and uh, you know, lay it at his feet and let, let the Holy spirit really, really work on you, you know? Um, so, you know, let's, let's wrap this up a little bit. I'd I'd like to know, like, if somebody really wants to check out, uh, metal mission and, you know, say somebody's in the Knoxville area, is, is there a way for them to come and serve with you guys or, you know, feed the honey or. Yeah. Like I said, you know, right now we're shut down for all our outreach, but once we get rolling again, um, they can check out metal mission in Knoxville on our Facebook page. Okay. We'll put links to all this there too. Okay, cool. And we update there, you know, what we're doing in our outreaches. And we're pretty much open to anybody coming out and serving with us. Uh, we don't put any rules on anybody. And usually people come out, what do you want me to do? I'm like, look around, see what you think needs to be done and just do it. Right. And that's, you know, it's just that kind of a thing. And it's just working for us. Um, we're hoping very soon to get back out on the street. We're hoping very soon to get some outreach ministries going again and, and get to some uh, local events and bend and things like that. When I say bend, we're giving away, you know, metal Bibles. Um, you got, have you seen those things, those metal Bibles? I have. Those things are awesome. Yeah, those, those are such an awesome tool. Yes. And so um, I think there's a group on Facebook that, 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 uh, that is a metal Bible group too. Well, that's where we get them from. They're, they come from Sweden. Okay. Uh, the Johan uh, is, is the guy who makes those. Okay, and, so so uh, that group, that's the dude that actually, because I see him in there all the time. So that's that's yeah, the actual guy. That's the guy. Yeah, he's the guy. So I contacted him, and through a friend, and um, we started. We got two shipments from Sweden, and now they have a distributor here in the states. So it it's a little cheaper for us to get them. So that we're paying, you know, roughly about six dollars a piece for them. But um, they they are so wanted and and uh, coveted by people. Awesome. And, and, and it's so funny because you'll give one of those to people. Never in my life have I heard anybody use a foul word, expletive, in excitement to get a Bible before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, but it's 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 a real it's a cutting edge thing. You know, the ministry's got, not for everybody. Right. You know, there's people that don't get it, and sure. it's fine because they you know God has something else for you to do. Yeah. Cool. And, and so it, it, is Twitter probably your most active? Uh, method of, of keep of, you know folks wanting to keep up with you um for me personally twitter is i'm pretty busy on twitter um at real paul honor um on facebook is primarily ministry stuff um uh, i keep up with the, the metal mission page i try to do at least once a week uh metal word of the day where we'll, i'll put up a, a, a graphic and, and a verse and a little narrative with it and i'll find videos like there's one i'm watching now about a a former atheist tattoo artist that came to Christ. I'm, I'm watching through that and probably going to post that up on our website and, and get that out there and promote it a little bit. And then my personal Facebook page, um, it's mostly just ministry stuff. Again, I'm not real big on here's what I ate for dinner tonight. Kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm promoting Christian music. I'm promoting Christian artists and, and just trying to get the word out to people that wouldn't normally, you know, be exposed to, to, to the word or to the gospel cool cool i have my youtube channel as well which has we have uh links we have youtube videos of our night in the word concerts uh there's a couple i think there's two full sets of place of skulls on there um you might want to check them out they're kind of doom metal Mm -hmm. and um then i got all my messages and all pastor eric's messages up there so we're you know using that as a platform to get the word out um actually getting opportunities in pakistan right now believe it or all so cool um these guys that have been involved in in um orphan ministry have been asking me to just record videos and send them to them to talk to the kids and then it's like me you want me to talk to the kids it's like wow oh yeah i will oh, do it <laughs> that's so that's so awesome man i mean so you know when I, when the, when the internet first came out everybody was kind of like oh it's the it's the enemy blah 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 and it's like Flip that over because God's glory can be used just as easily in, in everything that's going on with technology. So, right. That's right. 
So that's completely awesome, man. So we, we really appreciate you being with us on this episode, Pastor Paul. This has been really, really awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, Todd. This is awesome. Really cool opportunity. And, well, and it's I, fun. I really hope to do it again sometime. And uh, for this episode, this is Rockinod Todd signing off. And you guys be well and take care. Thanks. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Song of Verse podcast. Hopefully it was an uplifting, honest, and meaningful experience for you. We do accept donations. If you feel led to give to the Song and Verse Ministries, check out songandverseministries.com slash donate for a number of different ways to give back. And also be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. We hope you turn into the next episode of the Song and Verse podcast. Until then, keep searching for the DNA of God's Word found flowing through songs.